This video was made in partnership with CuriosityStream. Fish are one of the most diverse factions in the entire game. They are extremely popular among both casual and competitive players, and make up the vast majority of the aquatic player base. And with so many different potential fish builds to choose from, it can be difficult to know which builds are actually competitively viable in the current meta. So today, we're going to go through the tier list of fish. This will by no means be a comprehensive tier list, I mean there are more than 3,000 variants of the catfish build alone. Still, by highlighting the standout builds in both high and low tiers, hopefully I can give you a good understanding of where the fish faction fits into the current meta. And if there's a fish I didn't include, hopefully by seeing my logic in this video, you'll be able to evaluate that fish build yourself. Oh, also, quick disclaimer, since I've already made a shark tier list, I'm omitting sharks from this video. But before we dive into the tier list, first I want to give you an overview of the abilities commonly found in the fish faction, as well as some background on the history of the fish build. So the basic fish build doesn't have much in terms of unique perks or abilities, which is actually great as it means that each player has a lot of room for customization. The basic fish build is most famous for its use of the fin and gill abilities, both of which offer huge advantages in water while predictably being entirely useless on land. Back during the Devonian expansion, long before the vertebrate faction had unlocked terrestrial builds, fish were the top tier build in the game, having a crushing matchup against the top arthropods, their main competitors. In today's meta though, fish have to compete with a lot more than just arthropods, and typically place below the top marine builds like cetaceans and cephalopods. And with the nerfs to the Plagoderm armor ability that fish used to have access to, fish have had to get creative with their game strategies in order to survive the current meta. Now let's get into the tier list to see which strategies and abilities are worth specking into if you're a fish player. Seahorses are an extremely strange build with the lowest mobility stat of any fish in the game. This mobility stat is due entirely to their strange choice to spec into the prehensile tail ability at the cost of all but one of their fins. Now don't get me wrong, the prehensile tail ability can be extremely useful, especially for arboreal builds that use them to tether themselves to trees while keeping their hands and legs free for foraging. For a marine build though, I think there are better choices available. All the prehensile tail does is allow the seahorse to anchor itself to plants and rocks, preventing itself from getting tossed around by the current, which again it wouldn't need to do if it didn't lack fins. Now they do have pretty solid armor, which can make them difficult to actually take out but their extreme lack of mobility means the seahorse cannot dodge attacks. This leads them to getting smacked around by any player who feels like it, even ones without any special combat perks. And with their best matchup being against Plankton, to me there's no way the seahorse places any higher than F tier. Also in F tier we have the Ocean Sunfish. This probably isn't too shocking given that the sunfish is famously bad at defending itself, but for those unaware, the Ocean Sunfish has the highest HP stat of any fish in the game and relies on its giant size for protection. Similar to the Seahorse, the Sunfish's other stats are all extremely low and because of this, the Sunfish gets bullied hard by many of the common marine threats, both large and small. They get torn to bits and tossed around particularly badly by the mammalian player base. Sea Lions and Orcas in particular love flexing their superiority over the largest fish build in the game. But the sunfish has another huge weakness, parasites. See, the sunfish has soft, mucus-coated skin instead of the scales traditionally used by fish players. This makes the sunfish more vulnerable to parasites, which unfortunately means that even the best sunfish mains have to play while suffering from a wide variety of debuffs from parasite infestations. The sunfish players often solicit the help of support mains like the Ross and Shrimp to help cleanse themselves and may even sit at the water's surface to give bird mains the chance to attack the parasites. The gigantism strategy is usually a pretty reliable strategy for avoiding attacks. Elephants, whales, hippos, and rhinos are generally safe from attacks once they reach their max size. However, I think in order to make the strategy work, you need to actually be able to strike back to discourage repeated attacks. Otherwise, you're kinda just a damage sponge and will have your HP slowly whittled down as we often see happen to the sunfish mains. So because of all these vulnerabilities and over-reliance on support players for help, I have to place the ocean sunfish in F tier. 
The Flying Fish is a build with an extremely unique playstyle centered around maximizing mobility. By putting a huge amount of evolution points into their fin trait and mobility stat, they've actually gained the ability to glide through the air for surprisingly long distances. This is useful as an escape option when being attacked by a larger fish player. However, as unique a move as this is, I actually think this is a pretty poor strategy overall. Being airborne might put you out of range of an attack from another fish, but it's by no means a safe position, and in many cases, is actually seriously disadvantageous. Without any way to dodge attacks midair, flying fish are extremely vulnerable to bird attacks, which kind of nullifies the benefit of escaping an aquatic pursuer. And in addition, with no way to change direction midair, it's actually not that difficult for said fish player to just intercept the flying fish's landing. So overall, not that useful of an ability, tacked onto an otherwise unremarkable build. Also in D2 we have the Salmon family, which includes the fish builds like the Trout and the Char. This build actually has some pretty impressive stats, with high mobility being pretty much required in order to withstand the constant rushing flow of the rivers that they use as their respawn points. Similar to the Flying Fish, this playstyle is also highly vulnerable to disruption from non-aquatic players. As impressive as it is that Salmon and Trout mains are able to make these insane jumps, the sad truth is that the thing that they're most well known for is being an easy source of XP for carnivore players. Now, this jumping ability is also useful for attacking flying builds midair, but the Salmon's power stat isn't quite enough Double to be able to kill. take down anything that isn't far below their weight class. At the bottom of C tier, we have the Catfish, one of the tankier builds on this list with a bulky yet versatile stat spread. A lot of players undervalue the Catfish and see it as low tier trash due to it being a bottom feeder, not realizing that they've actually got a few decent unique abilities, most important of which is their Venom. Rather than specking their fin appendages to do things like flying or flexing, the Catfish builds spec into fins that have barbs on them, which can deliver a venomous sting. While their Venom usually isn't able to deal lethal damage, it's still a decent defensive ability. It does have its weaknesses though, particularly to long, disjointed hitboxes, such as the spear-like beaks of some bird builds. Nonetheless, the Catfish is still a reliable and easy to play build, being omnivorous and able to gain plenty of XP simply by digging through the mud for scraps. Also in C tier we have the Archer Fish, the only fish build with the ability to use a ranged attack. This projectile deals essentially zero damage, but it's by no means useless. This projectile has high knockback, making it excellent for pushing players into vulnerable positions. A waterlogged insect is one of the easiest targets in the game, and being able to force that type of interaction is an extremely powerful ability. This ability does have its limitations though. As is the case with most projectiles, this attack is unusable in the water, meaning that the Archerfish doesn't really have any good moves for PvP against other aquatic players. I think the biggest weakness of this playstyle, though, is the position that you're forced into in order to make use of your projectile weapon. Being near the surface of the water leaves you vulnerable to both attacks from below and above, and with no defense against either, the Archerfish is a high-risk, decent reward build. In B tier we have the builds that are generally solid picks, but lack any truly overpowered abilities. First is the Bass, the poster child for the phrase, big fish in a small pond. With solid stats and the ability to grow larger than most other freshwater lake fish, the bass can easily dominate their local scene, even to the point of depleting the area of resources by gobbling them all up. Their generalist nature and large jaws mean they can prey upon just about anything from smaller fish to crustaceans to even builds like frogs and alligators. While there's not that much that's flashy or unique about this strategy, there's no denying that the bass is a consistent threat in the pond meta, and I consider them the gatekeepers of the higher tiers. Also in B tier we have the Fish Faction's premier support class, the Cleaner Ross. The Cleaner Ross specializes in cleansing larger fish players of parasites, providing an extremely useful service in the form of removing debuffs from any fish player in need, similar to the Oxpecker on land. Parasites are a major threat to fish players, so it's no surprise that oftentimes even top tier builds like Sharks will add Cleaner Ross players to their party. Ross do have to rely on their reputation to protect them though, and while betrayals during cleansing sessions are rare, swimming into a mouthful of dagger-like teeth is not without risk. Alright, now we're in A tier and this is where things start to get a bit overpowered. First, we have the Pickerel Guild, which includes the Pike and Muscalunge, the most fearsome freshwater fish in the game. 
These vicious fish builds are highly aggressive and attack anything in or around their domain, from fish to birds to mammals and even humans. Their powerful jaws sport sharp crocodile-esque teeth, which deal serious damage and grip their target preventing their escape. But it's not just about power with these fish. Their slender body and camouflage allow them to easily hide in cover, waiting for the perfect ambush opportunity. And unlike trout, when these fish jump, it's not just to clear an obstacle, they jump to attack. Their only weakness is a slow growth rate and long respawn timer. But even at low levels, these fish are adept hunters. While not part of the Pickerel Guild, I also include the Barracuda in this same rating, as they have a very similar playstyle. Giant size is not a requirement to be a high tier predator though, as exemplified by the next build on this list, the Piranha. Piranhas are one of the best, if not the best, example of how with the right combination of special abilities and team strategies, size genuinely doesn't matter. Their special ability, Feeding Frenzy, boosts Piranha Shoal DPS to one of the highest in the game, able to absolutely melt through the HP of even the tankiest targets. In contrast to the Salmon and Trout, because of their favorable matchup against larger players, Piranhas are the only fish build on this list that I think actually make great use of its positional advantage in rivers, as many mammals and birdmates will be forced to cross your territory over the course of their playthrough and fall victim to your frenzy attacks. Their main weakness is a lack of defensive capability, meaning that they can still be easily one-shot by other Predator players. The next build on this tier list does not share this weakness. The Lionfish is one of the most well-defended fish builds in the game, relying on a huge arsenal of venomous spines to deal serious damage to attackers, similar to the Porcupine build on land. Because of this, the Lionfish is an infamously unpleasant target to attack, and most Predator players tend to either ignore or actively avoid them. While their other stats are quite low, this certainly hasn't stopped them from rising to dominance in their home server of the Indo-Pacific. Lionfish are also generalists, who gobble up anything that their low mobility stat allows them to catch, which can quickly deplete a server of its resources. And because of their quick respawn rate, Lionfish have rapidly spread to other ocean servers without much pushback, at least until they reach the tropical Atlantic. See, there is one fish build that has been able to consistently take down Lionfish, and once I show you how broken some of their abilities are, it'll be easy to understand why. We've got two more builds to showcase in S tier, but real quick, I just want to point out that this is the longest video I've made so far, and took a huge amount of time and resources to produce. So if you're enjoying it and want more content like this, please do consider subscribing. Thanks! The Moray Eel is one of the most uniquely powerful fish in the game. With a set of strange yet highly functional abilities and well-placed base stat allocations. So first, their stats. While the highest aquatic power rating falls to sharks and whales, a close runner-up is the Moray. Their teeth resemble broken glass and can do similarly brutal damage in combat. Their mobility is surprisingly high for a fish that lacks pectoral and pelvic fins. But in addition to having great maneuverability in the tight spaces of a reef, they're capable of some pretty impressive bursts of speed too. Their stealth may seem low due to their vibrant coloring, but honestly, bright colors are everywhere in reef servers, so they don't stick out too much. In fact, their ability to contort and fit into crevices and other tight spaces gives them a pretty huge advantage for ambushing other players. Where things get interesting though is with their defense. The Moray has a slime-based special ability, which serves multiple defensive purposes. It protects them from taking abrasion and puncture damage while passing through sharp coral and jagged spaces within the reef. But perhaps more surprisingly, it's great at deflecting damage from things like teeth and spikes. Not only does this give them a great matchup against sharks, but it also makes them one of the only builds in the game capable of taking down the lionfish. This excellent matchup spread makes placing the Moray Eel in S tier an easy decision. The final build on this tier list is the Billfish. This includes the Marlin, Swordfish, and Sailfish, all of which have similar playstyles. This group is top tier for two reasons. First is that they have the highest swim speed in the game, beating out not just all other fish, but also mammals and birds. In addition to having unmatched speed, their large dorsal fins allow them to make tighter turns than most fish too, making them extremely good at chasing down prey. Their most unique trait, however, is their bill, one of the strangest offensive abilities in the game. Useful for both slashing and stabbing, this attack is one of the few in the game able to hit multiple targets at once. 
This makes it excellent for countering the ubiquitous safety number strategy many fish players adopt. And since the billfish hunt in packs, they can rack up insane kill counts, rivaling the hunting prowess of even a pot of dolphins. With busted stats and a signature move that's both flashy and downright broken, to me there's no question that the billfish is the most overpowered fish build in the game. Regardless of where your favorite fish build falls on the tier list, one thing's for sure. Adaptation is key to survivability in the current meta, and it's important to always be exploring new strategies to stay ahead of the curve. The same can be said for YouTubers, and this is why a bunch of creators and I have started an experiment called Nebula, a new platform that gives us the freedom to pursue the projects we want without needing to fear demonetization nor optimize for YouTube's desired metrics. In addition to posting ad-free versions of all my new videos days in advance on Nebula, there's also hours of original content on there that you can't get anywhere else. On top of my Let's Play Outside series, which I've talked about before, I've also recently put out a podcast with my friend Alex from the channel Low Spec Gamer, where he interviews me about my creation process and how I started this channel. I'd love for you to go and check it out. So what does CuriosityStream have to do with this? Well, not only have they been this channel's biggest supporter for quite some time now, they've also partnered with Nebula so that we can bring you both services for less than the cost of either one individually. Normally, the annual subscription to CuriosityStream is $20 a year, and the typical Nebula subscription is $30 per year. Yet when combined, you can get both for $14.79, easily one of the best deals in streaming. And of course, CuriosityStream is also an excellent service, with thousands of high-quality documentaries to buff your knowledge stat. If you want to learn more about fish, I recommend their docu-series Deep Ocean, narrated by the legendary David Attenborough. But if you're just in the mood for some nostalgia, they've also got those awesome old BBC dinosaur documentaries too. So whatever you're in the mood for, this bundle has you covered. To get started, head over to CuriosityStream.com slash Thank you all so much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons on Patreon. Until next time, good luck out there.